Re Optics and Optical Instruments Introduction Nature has endowed the human eye with the sensitivity to detect electromagnetic waves within a small range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic radiation belonging to this region or the spectrum is called light. It is mainly through light and the sense of vision that we know and interpret the world around us. Reflection of Light by Spherical Mirrors The angle of reflection that is, the angle between the reflected ray and the normal to the reflecting surface or the mirror equals the angle of incidence. Also, the incident ray, reflected ray and the normal to the reflecting surface at the point of incidence lie in the same plane. The geometric centre of a spherical mirror is called its pole while that of a spherical lens is called its optical centre. The line joining the pole and the centre of curvature of the spherical mirror is known as the principal axis. In the case of spherical lenses, the principal axis is the line joining the optical centre with its principal focus. Sign Convention According to the Cartesian Sign Convention, all distances are measured from the pole of the mirror or the optical centre of the lens. The distances measured in the same direction as the incident light are taken as positive and those measured in the direction opposite to the direction of incident light are taken as negative. The heights measured upwards with respect to the x-axis and the normal to the principal axis that is the x-axis of the mirror or lens are taken as positive. The heights measured downwards are taken as negative. Focal length of spherical mirrors the figure shows what happens when a parallel beam of light is incident on a concave mirror and a convex mirror. We assume that the rays are paraxial, that is, they are incident at points close to the point P of the mirror and make small angles with the principal axis. The reflected rays converge at a point F on the principal axis of a concave mirror for a convex mirror. The reflected rays appear to diverge from a point F on its principal axis. The point F is called the principal focus of the mirror. If the parallel paraxial beam of light were incident, making some angle with the principal axis, the reflected rays would converge or diverge from a point in a plane through F normal to the principal axis. This is called the focal plane of the mirror. The distance between the focus F and the pole P of the mirror is called the focal length of the mirror and is denoted by F. We now show that F equals R by 2 where R is the radius of curvature of the mirror. The geometry of reflection of an incident ray is shown in the figure. Let C be the centre of curvature of the mirror. Consider a ray parallel to the principal axis striking the mirror at M. Then CM will be perpendicular to the mirror at M. Let theta be the angle of incidence and MD be the perpendicular from M on the principal axis. Mirror equation. If rays emanating from a point actually meet at another point after reflection and or refraction, that point is called the image of the first point. The image is real if the rays actually converge to the point. It is virtual if the rays do not actually meet but appear to diverge from the point when produced backwards. We can take any two rays emanating from a point on an object, trace their paths, find their point of intersection and thus obtain the image of the point due to reflection at a spherical mirror. In practice, however, it is convenient to choose any of the two following rays given above. The figure shows the ray diagram considering three rays. It shows the image A-B- of an object AB formed by a concave mirror. It does not mean that only three rays emanate from the point A. An infinite number of rays emanate from any source in all directions. Thus, point A- is image of point A if every ray originating from point A and following on the concave mirror after reflection passes through the point A- we now derive the mirror equation or the relationship between the object distance u, image distance v and the focal length f. We note that light travels from the object to mirror mpn, hence this is taken as the positive direction. To reach the object ab, the image a-b 
as well as the focus F from the pole P, we have to travel opposite to the direction of incident light. Hence, all the three will have negative signs. We have derived here the mirror equation and the magnification formula for the case of real inverted image formed by a concave mirror. With the proper use of sign convention, these are valid for all cases of reflection by a spherical mirror, whether the image formed is real or virtual. The figure shows the ray diagrams for virtual image formed by a concave and convex mirror. Refraction Snell's Laws It is the change in direction of a wave due to a change in its speed. This is most commonly seen when a wave passes from one medium to another. Refraction of light is the most commonly seen example, but any type of wave can refract when it interacts with a medium. For example, when sound waves pass from one medium into another or when water waves move into water of a different depth, refraction is described by Snell's law, which states that the angle of incidence is related to the angle of reflection by sin i by sin r, which equals n to the base 21. Refraction experiment For a rectangular slab, refraction takes place at two interfaces. It is easily seen from figure that R2 equals I1, that is, the emergent ray is parallel to the incident ray. There is no deviation, but it does suffer lateral displacement or shift with respect to the incident ray. Another familiar observation is that the bottom of a tank filled with water appears to be raised for viewing near the normal direction. It can be shown that the apparent depth that is h to the base 1 is real depth that is h to the base 2 divided by the refractive index of the medium that is water in this case. Refraction of light through the atmosphere. For example, the sun is visible a little before the actual sunrise and until a little after the actual sunset due to refraction of light through the atmosphere by actual sunrise. We mean the actual crossing of the horizon by the sun. The figure shows the actual and apparent positions of the sun with respect to the horizon. The figure is highly exaggerated to show the effect. Total internal reflection. When a ray of light enters from a denser medium to a rarer medium, it bends away from the normal for example, the ray AO1B in figure. The incident ray AO1 is partially reflected, that is O1C, and partially transmitted O1B, or refracted. The angle of refraction, that is R, being larger than the angle of incidence, that is I. As the angle of incidence increases, so does the angle of refraction. Till for the ray AO3, the angle of refraction is pi by 2. The refracted ray is bent so much away from the normal that it grazes the surface at the interface between the two media. This is shown by the ray AO3D in the figure. If the angle of incidence is increased still further, example the ray AO4, refraction is not possible and the incident ray is totally reflected. This is called total internal reflection. Critical angles the angle of incidence corresponding to an angle of refraction 90 degrees is called the critical angle, that is IC, for the given pair of media. Some typical critical angles are listed in the table above. Mirage On hot summer days, the air near the ground becomes hotter than the air at higher levels. The refractive index of air increases with its density. Hotter air is less dense and has smaller refractive index than cooler air. If the air currents are small, that is, the air is still, the optical density at different layers of air increases with height. As a result, light from a tall object, such as a tree, passes through a medium whose refractive index decreases towards the ground. Thus, a ray of light from such an object bends away from the normal and undergoes total internal reflection. If the angle of incidence for the air near the ground exceeds the critical angle, this is shown in the figure, such inverted images of distant tall objects cause an optical illusion to the observer. This phenomenon is called a mirage. Optical fibers. Optical fibers are fabricated with high quality composite glass or quartz fibers. Each fiber consists of a core and cladding. The refractive index of the material of the core is higher than the cladding. When a signal in the form of light is directed at one end of the fiber, then a suitable angle, it undergoes repeated total internal reflections 
along the length of the fiber and finally comes out at the other end. Since light undergoes total internal reflection at each stage, there is no appreciable loss in the intensity of the light signal. Optical fibers are fabricated such that the light reflected at one end of inner surface strikes the other at an angle larger than the critical angle. Refraction at spherical surface The figure shows the geometry of formation of image I of an object O on the principal axis of a spherical surface with center of curvature C and radius of curvature R. The rays are incident from a medium of refractive index N1 to another of refractive index N2. As before, we take the aperture of the surface to be small compared to the other distances involved. In particular, Nm will be taken to a nearly equal to the length of the perpendicular from the point N on the principal axis. The derivations are as follows. Refraction by a lens The figure A shows the geometry of image formation by a double convex lens. The image formation can be seen in terms of two steps. One, the first refracting surface forms the image I1 of the object O in the figure B. The image I1 acts as a virtual object for the second surface that forms the image at I in the figure C. For a thin lens, BI1 equals DI1. Adding equations 1 and 2, we get equation 3. Suppose the object is at infinity, that is, OB tends to infinity, and DI equals F, equation 3 gives equation 4. The point where image of an object is placed at infinity is formed is called the focus F of the lens, and the distance F gives its focal length. A lens has two foci. One is F and the other is F dash. On either side of it, please observe figure C, by the sign convention, BC1 equals plus R1 and DC2 equals minus R2. So equation 4 can be written as shown above. Equation 5 is known as the lens maker's formula. Power of a lens Power of a lens is a measure of the convergence or divergence which a lens introduces in the light falling on it. The most important characteristic of a lens is its principal focal length or its inverse which is called the lens strength or power of the lens. The lens power is the inverse of the focal length in meters. The physical unit for lens power is 1 per meter which is called the diopter. It is also defined as the tangent of the angle by which it converges or diverges a beam of light falling at unit distant from the optical center. Refraction through a prism the figure shows the passage of light through a triangular prism ABC. The angles of incidence and refraction at the first phase AB and I are R1, while the angle of incidence at the second phase AC is R2, and the angle of refraction or emergence E. The angle between the emergent rays RS and the direction of the incident ray PQ is called the angle of deviation, that is, sigma. In the quadrilateral AQNR, Two of the angles at the vertices Q and R are right angles. Therefore, the sum of the other angles of the quadrilateral is 180 degrees. We can see that the angle of deviation depends on the angle of incidence. A plot between the angle of deviation and the angle of incidence is shown in the figure. We can see that in general, for any given value of sigma, except for I equals E, corresponds to the two values I and hence of E, from the above equation, we can imply that thin prisms do not deviate much light. Dispersion by a prism In a classic experiment, Isaac Newton put another prism in an inverted position and let the emergent beam from the first prism fall on the second prism. The resultant emergent beam was found to be white light. The explanation was clear. The first prism splits the white light into its component colors while the inverted prism recombines them to give white light. Thus, white light itself consists of light of different colors which are separated by a prism. It must be understood here that a ray of light, as defined mathematically, does not exist. An actual ray is really a beam of many rays of light. Each ray splits into component colors when it enters the glass prism. When those colored rays come out on the other side, they again produce a white beam. Refractive indices Refractive indices for different wavelengths for crown glass and flint glass are listed in the table above. The rainbow. In figure A, sunlight is first refracted as it enters a raindrop, 
which causes the different wavelengths of white light to separate. Longer wavelength of light red are bent least, while the shorter wavelength violet are bent the most. Next, these component rays strike the inner surface of the water drop and get internally reflected if the angle between the refracted ray and normal of the drop surface is greater than the critical angle, that is 48 degrees in this case. The reflected light is refracted again as it comes out of the drop as shown in the figure. It is found that the violet light emerges at an angle of 40 degrees related to the incoming sunlight and red light emerges at an angle of 42 degrees. For other colors, angles lie in between these two values. Figure B explains the formation of a primary rainbow. We see the red from the drop 1 and violet from the drop 2 reach the observer's eyes. The violet from drop 1 and red from drop 2 are directed at level above or below the observer. When light rays undergoes two internal reflections inside a raindrop, instead of one as in the primary rainbow, a secondary rainbow is formed as shown Scattering of light As sunlight travels through the Earth's atmosphere, it gets scattered by the atmospheric particles. Light of shorter wavelengths is scattered much more than light of longer wavelengths. The amount of scattering is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the wavelength. This is known as Rayleigh's scattering law. At sunset or sunrise, the sun's rays have to pass through a larger distance in the atmosphere. As in the figure, most of the blue and other shorter wavelengths are removed by scattering. The least scattered light reaches our eyes. Therefore, the sun looks reddish. This explains the reddish appearance of the sun and full moon near the horizon. The eye. Light enters the eye through a curved front surface, the cornea. It passes through the pupil, which is the central hole in the iris. The size of the pupil can change under control of muscles. The light is further focused by the eye lens on the retina. The retina is a film of nerve fibers covering the curved back surface of the eye. The retina contains rods and cones which sense light intensity and color. Presbyopia If an elderly person tries to read a book at about 25 cm from the eyes, the image appears blurred. This defect of the eye is called presbyopia. It is corrected by using a converging lens for reading. The light from a distant object arriving at the eye lens may be getting converged at a point in front of the retina. This type of defect is called nearsightedness or myopia. This means that the eye is producing too much convergence in the incident beam. To compensate for this, we interpose a concave lens between the eye and the object with the diverging effect desired to get the image focused on the retina. Hypermetropia if the eye lens focuses the incoming light at a point behind the retina, a convergent lens is needed to compensate for the defect in vision. This defect is called farsightedness or hypermetropia. Astigmatism It occurs when the cornea is not spherical in shape. For example, the cornea could have a large curvature at the vertical plane than in the horizontal plane or vice versa. Astigmatism results in lines in one direction being well focused while those in a perpendicular direction may appear distorted. Astigmatism can be corrected by using a cylindrical lens of desired radius or curvature with an appropriately directed axis. The microscope. If the object is at a distance f, the image is at infinity. However, if the object is at a distance slightly less than the focal length of the lens, the image is virtual and closer than infinity. Although the closest comfortable distance for viewing the image is when it is at a near point, it causes some strain on the eye. Therefore, the image formed at infinity is often considered most suitable for viewing by the relaxed eye. We show both cases. The first in figure A and the second in figure B and C. The linear magnification M for the image formed at the near point D by a simple microscope can be obtained by using the relation given above. Compound microscope The lens nearest the object, called the objective, forms a real, inverted, magnified image of the object. This serves as the object for the compound lens. The eyepiece, which functions essentially like a simple microscope or magnifier, produces the final image, which is enlarged and virtual. The first inverted image is thus near 
at or within the focal plane of the eyepiece at a distance appropriate for final image formation at infinity or a little closer for image formation at a near point. Clearly, the final image is inverted with respect to the original object. We now obtain the magnification due to a compound microscope. Telescope The telescope is used to provide angular magnification of distant objects. The objective has a large focal length and a much larger aperture than the eyepiece. Light from distant objects enters the objective and a real image is formed in the tube at its second focal point. The eyepiece magnifies this image, producing a final inverted image. The magnifying power m is the ratio of the angle beta subtended at the eye by the final image to the angle alpha which the object subtends at the lens or the eye. In this case, the length of the telescope tube is f o plus f e.